Be sure to hop on over to the Spiritual Broadcast Network. It's the go-to place for all things spiritual. You'll discover internet television shows that you won't find anywhere else. You can also choose from hundreds of hours of spiritual documentaries and movies. You'll enjoy on-demand and live internet television programming 24-7. Best of all, we add new dramas, comedies, talk and reality shows and more on a daily basis. So why spend countless hours searching the web when you can quickly find just what you want on the Spiritual Broadcast Network? Wisdom Through Action is a contemporary, sea-influenced school teaching the work of personal inner development in the system brought to the Western world by G.I. Gurdjieff and P.D. Ospensky. Mr. Ospensky said, The most important ideas and principles of this system do not belong to me. This is chiefly what makes them valuable, because if they belonged to me, they would be like all other theories invented by ordinary minds. What he meant was that this system comes from higher mind, from conscious influence. It is an objective system to bring a man to awakening. Hello, and welcome to Wisdom Through Action. I'm your host, Kay Smith. I'm going to start today's show with a reading from Maurice Nicole's book, Psychological Commentaries on the Teachings of Gurdjieff and Ospensky. It's, it's a, actually a, a six-volume series, if, if you're not uh, familiar with it. It's an excellent book. This particular commentary is entitled, Man's Situation on the Earth. It is sometimes said in the work that the most powerful force that we can make in ourselves is understanding. On one occasion, at the beginning of the war, Mr. Ospensky was asked what view should be taken, how one should think about it. He said in so many words that we must try to understand why all these things happened. Now, there is very little understanding in life, and it has often seemed to me that understanding is diminishing. But when Mr. Ospensky said that we must try to understand, he meant, of course, that we must apply the knowledge and teaching of this work to the present situation and try to understand why things go as they do. In order to do this, one must have a certain power of reflection, a certain detachment from external things. The work teaches that we are very far down in the scale of being and exist on a planet which is under 48 orders of laws, and that we are removed by only one place from the very, very lowest level of the universe, which is that level called the moon, which is under 96 orders of laws. It is necessary to reflect on what this means and to connect it in one's mind. We exist in a world which is obviously far from perfect, and the work teaches that we exist on this planet because we ourselves cannot exist on a better one. Our average level of being, the kind of people we are, is such that we could not possibly exist in a better world. Yet the work teaches that there are better worlds, and it says the interesting thing that a better world is under fewer laws and a worse world is under more laws. This means that in a better world we are less imprisoned and in a worse world we are more imprisoned. At present, we are in a world under 48 orders of laws, that is, in a prison in which 48 orders of laws exist from which we cannot escape. And whatever we do in trying to change our world in an external way, as for example by means of science, we shall still be under 48 orders of laws. The work teaches that the only way to get to a better place in the universe is through self-change. But since we all, owing to the power of the senses over us, see improvement as lying only in change in external conditions, we miss the point. Let us review for a moment the present state of the world and the present ideals that dominate people in regard to making this planet a better world. You see on one side inventions such as penicillin and many other similar things which are a benefit to mankind. And on the other hand, you see the inventions of destructive agents, such as poisonous gas, atomic bombs, and so on. For everything that is invented of a beneficial nature, there seems to be invented an opposite of a harmful nature. Man, feeling that he can do, does not see this continual contradiction. 
He does not see that he is living in a world under a definite order of laws that cannot be changed. It is as if there were always the same amount of everything, and if a thing is got rid of in one place, it appears again in another place. There is always the same amount of air, let us say, in an air, cu- in an air cushion. You may push it in one place, but it will swell out in another place. This idea that we live in a contained world of this kind, a prison, under a definite number of laws, is not understood. The work says, amongst other things, that the earth is a pain factory from which a certain quantity of pain and suffering is demanded. People believe that medicine is going to do away with illness, but what happens actually is that if a relative cure for one thing is found, you will practically always find that some other illness increases. Let us suppose that smallpox as a disease has been decreased by vaccination, but cancer has increased. I'm not making any definite connections between these two things, but simply indicating in general what happens. Can you mention a single law that you are under? I'm not talking about man-made laws, but about laws belonging to this earth on which we appear for a brief period. One of these laws is that you have to eat. If you don't eat, you die. This is a law. Another law is that you have to breathe oxygen. If you do not breathe oxygen or if you breathe carbon monoxide from a charcoal stove, you die. This is a law belonging to this planet. Yet, curiously enough, we do not see ourselves as being under laws of this kind and imagine ourselves as being quite free and able to do exactly as we like. In other words, we do not reflect upon the nature of our lives on this earth. And we have the constant illusion that we can do, that we can alter everything in our favor. And because we have this illusion that we can do, we also have the equally firm illusion that we are progressing and that the mere passage of time means that we all get better and better and more and more comfortable. We regard things like wars as exceptions, just as we regard illnesses as exceptions, not seeing that they are the rule and belong to our level of being. What is the way out from this prison? in which these laws constantly interact and play on humanity like a set of different colored spotlights? The work, the Gospels, and all esoteric teaching say the same thing. To begin to escape from these 48 orders of laws governing this planetary prison called the Earth, a man must cease to see the final solution in changing external conditions, but must see it in changing himself. He must begin to change his relationship to this world And in order to do so, he must begin to observe himself and the world and work on his mechanical reactions to it. This is the whole meaning of the Sermon on the Mount, which has nothing to do with being pious, but has a far deeper meaning and a far more interesting meaning. If a man remains mechanical, he will always think and feel and speak in the same mechanical way. He remains in prison. But if a man begins to try to awaken he begins to pass under fewer laws. Everything taught in this work about negative emotions, identifying, internal considering, self-remembering, about vanity and pride, about making accounts, about imagination, about false personality, and so on, has to do with coming under fewer laws, that is, better influences. And all these things that the work is constantly talking to you about and asking you to practice begin with observing yourself with waking up from the state of sleep in which you are merely functions of life and merely serve nature and have no inner hope, no inner stability, no inner peace of mind. In this great prison of the world under these 48 orders of laws, mankind as a whole is asleep. The work, the gospels, and all esoteric teaching seek to awaken man out of this state of sleep. The central idea is that Man can undergo a definite change, a definite transformation, if he will work on himself in the right way. This is called inner change or inner development, and it is a quite definite thing that you can can become more aware of yourself once it has begun to touch you. Then instead of remaining acorns which swine can eat, you begin to grow into trees which no swine can eat. What would completely change the world at this moment? The world would change completely if everyone had goodwill. Such 
An idea is vaguely mentioned, even by politicians. Do you know what it means to have goodwill? You may imagine that you have goodwill. Now suppose that you begin to observe yourself and your daily actions, and suppose that you begin to become responsible for your, to yourself for your inner thoughts and what you say secretly. Can you any longer have the illusion that you have goodwill? You will begin to see that an immense task it is to get free from these evil places in mind and feeling. Then you will begin to understand what this work is about, and you will also understand how impossible it is for humanity as a whole to change, since it is so difficult for you yourself to change in, the present, in this respect. When such ideas come to us, we begin really to think, we begin to reflect, and to want to understand. We begin to understand, for example, why things go as they do and why no one can do anything. But it is always possible for some people to change who wish to do so and wish to study how it is possible to change and what it means. Now we will be showing a video on the law of octaves, which is one of the big laws that we live under. Everything in the universe goes by the law of three and the law of seven, also known as the law of octaves. Here we will be talking about the law of octaves. In right knowledge, the study of man must proceed on parallel lines with the study of the world, and the study of the world must run parallel with the study of man. Laws are everywhere the same, in the world as well as in man. Having mastered the principles of any one law, we must look for its manifestation in the world and in man simultaneously. Moreover, some laws are more easily observed in the world, others are more easily observed in man. Therefore, in certain cases, it is better to begin with the world and then to pass on to man, and in other cases, it is better to begin with man and then to pass on to the world. This parallel study of the world and of man shows the student the fundamental unity of everything and helps him to find analogies in phenomena of different orders. The number of fundamental laws which govern all processes both in the world and in man is very small. Different numerical combinations of a few elementary forces create all the seeming variety of phenomena. In order to understand the mechanics of the universe, it is necessary to resolve complex phenomena into these elementary forces. The first fundamental law of the universe is the law of three forces, or three principles, or as it is often called, the law of three. According to this law, Every action, every phenomenon, in all worlds, without exception, is the result of a simultaneous action of three forces, the positive, the negative, and the neutralizing. The law of three is a separate line of study which we will return to in the future. Before we start on a technical understanding of the law of octaves, it is important that you understand and feel the law of octaves or law of seven in yourself. Only then will you see it outside yourself. In order to understand the meaning of this law, it is necessary to regard the universe as consisting of vibrations. This image shows the square and circle in an atomic pattern at the tip of a platinum needle enlarged 750,000 times. These are patterns of geometrized light energy. These vibrations proceed in all kinds, aspects, and densities of the matter which constitutes the universe, from the finest to the coarsest. They issue from various sources and proceed in various directions, crossing one another, colliding, strengthening, weakening, arresting one another, and so on. In this connection, according to the usual views accepted in the West, vibrations are continuous. This means that vibrations are usually regarded as proceeding uninterruptedly. 
ascending or descending so long as the force of the original impulse which caused the vibration and which overcomes the resistance of the medium in which the vibrations proceed continues to act. When the force of the impulse becomes exhausted and the resistance of the medium gains the upper hand, the vibrations naturally die down and stop. But until this moment is reached, that is, until the beginning of the natural weakening, the vibrations develop uniformly and gradually, and in the absence of resistance can even be endless. Thus, one of the fundamental propositions of our physics is the continuity of vibrations, although this has never been precisely formulated because it has never been opposed. In certain of the newest theories, this proposition is beginning to be shaken. Nevertheless, physics is still very far from a correct view of the nature of vibrations, or what corresponds to our conception of vibrations in the real world. In this instance, the view of ancient knowledge is opposed to that of contemporary science, because at the base of the understanding of vibrations, ancient knowledge places the principle of the discontinuity of vibrations. For example, we can use the ray of creation. Pythagoras placed this ancient knowledge in the musical scale as shown. The principle of the discontinuity of vibrations means the definite and necessary characteristic of all vibrations in nature whether ascending or descending, is to develop not uniformly, but with periodical accelerations and retardations. This principle can be formulated still more precisely if we say that the force of the original impulse in vibrations does not act uniformly, but, as it were, becomes alternately stronger and weaker. The force of the impulse acts without changing its nature, and vibrations develop in a regular way, only for a certain time, which is determined by the nature of the impulse, the medium, the conditions, and so forth. But at a certain moment, a kind of change takes place in it, and the vibrations, so to speak, cease to obey it and for a short time they slow down and to a certain extent change their nature or direction. For example, ascending vibrations at a certain moment begin to ascend more slowly, and in descending octaves the vibrations are retarded. They begin to descend more slowly at the beginning of the octave. After this temporary retardation, both in ascending and descending octaves, the vibrations again enter the former channel and for a certain time ascend or descend uniformly up to a certain moment when a check in their development again takes place. In this connection, it is significant that the periods of uniform action of the momentum are not equal and that the moments of retardation of the vibrations are not symmetrical. One period is shorter, the other is longer. In order to determine these moments of retardation, or rather the checks in the ascent and descent of vibrations, the lines of development of vibrations are divided into periods corresponding to the doubling or the halving of the number of vibrations in a given space of time. Let us imagine a line of increasing vibrations. Let us take them at the moment when they are vibrating at the rate of 1000 per second. After a certain time the number of vibrations is doubled, that is, reaches 2000 per second. It has been found and established that in this interval of vibrations between the given number of vibrations and a number twice as large 
there are two places where a retardation in the increase of vibrations takes place. One is near the beginning, but not at the beginning itself. The other occurs almost at the end. The laws which govern the retardation or the deflection of vibrations from their primary direction were known to ancient science. These laws were duly incorporated into a particular formula or diagram which has been preserved up to our times. In this formula, the period in which vibrations are doubled was divided into eight unequal steps corresponding to the rate of increase in the vibrations. The eighth step repeats the first step with double the number of vibrations. This period of the doubling of the vibrations, or the line of the development of vibrations, between a given number of vibrations and double that number, is called an octave, that is, composed of eight. The principle of dividing into eight unequal parts, that is the period in which the vibrations are doubled, is based upon the observation of the non-uniform increase of vibrations in the entire octave. And separate steps of the octave show acceleration and retardation at different moments of its development. In the guise of this formula, ideas of the octave have been handed down from teacher to pupil from one school to another. In very remote times, one of these schools found that it was possible to apply this formula to music. In this way was obtained the seven-tone musical scale, which was known in the most distant antiquity, then forgotten, and then discovered or found again. The seven-tone scale is the formula of a cosmic law which was worked out by ancient schools and applied to music. At the same time, however, if we study the manifestations of the law of octaves and vibrations of other kinds, we shall see that the laws are everywhere the same. We shall see that light, heat, chemical, magnetic, and other vibrations are subject to the same laws as sound vibrations. For instance, the light scale is known to physics, and in chemistry, the periodic system of the elements is, without doubt, closely connected with the principle of octaves, although this connection is still not fully clear to science. A study of the structure of the seven-tone musical scale gives a very good foundation for understanding the cosmic law of octaves. Let us again take the ascending octave, that is, the octave in which the frequency of vibrations increases. Let us suppose that this octave begins with 1,000 vibrations per second. Let us designate these 1,000 vibrations by the note DO. Vibrations are growing, that is, their frequency is increasing. At the point where they reach 2,000 vibrations per second, there will be a second DO, that is, the DO of the next octave. The period between one DO and the next is an octave. The octave, particularly the major octave, is really a picture or formula of a cosmic law. The reason why it is necessary to understand the law of seven is that it plays a very important part in all events. If there were no law of seven, everything in the world would go to its final conclusion. But because of this law, everything deviates. For instance, if rain began, it would go on without stopping. If floods began, they would cover everything. If an earthquake began, it would go on indefinitely. But they stop because of the law of seven, because at every missing semitone, things deviate. They do not go by straight lines. The law of seven also explains why there are no straight lines in nature. Everything in our life and our machine is also based on this law. So we shall study it in the work of our organism, because we have to study ourselves, not only psychologically, not only in connection with our mental life, 
but also in connection with our physical life. In our physical processes, we find many examples of the working of this law. At the same time, the Law of Seven explains that if you know how and at what moment to do it, you can give an additional shock to an octave and keep the line straight. We can observe in human activity how people start to do one thing and after some time do quite a different thing, still calling it by the first name without noticing that things have completely changed. But in personal work, particularly in work connected with this system, we must learn how to keep these octaves from deviating, how to keep a straight line, otherwise we shall not find anything. If we grasp its full meaning, the law of octaves gives us an entirely new explanation of the whole of life, of the progress and development of phenomena on all planes of the universe observed by us. Again, this law explains why there are no straight lines in nature, and also why we can neither think nor do, why everything with us is thought, why everything happens with us, and happens usually in a way opposed to what we want or expect. All this is the clear and direct effect of the intervals, or retardations, in the development of vibrations. What precisely does happen at the moment of the retardation of vibrations? A deviation from the original direction takes place. The octave begins in the direction shown by the arrow, but a deviation takes place between me and fa. The line begun at do changes its direction, and through fa, sol, la, and si, it descends at an angle to its original direction shown by the first three notes. Between C and Do, the second interval occurs. A fresh deviation, a further change of direction. The next octave gives an even more marked deviation. The one following that, a deviation that is more marked still. So that the line of octaves may at last turn completely around and proceed in a direction opposite to the original direction. In developing further, the line of octaves or the line of development of vibrations may return to the original direction. In other words, make a complete circle. This law shows why straight lines never occur in our activities, why, having begun to do one thing, we in fact constantly do something entirely different, often the opposite of the first, although we do not notice this and continue to think that we are doing the same thing that we began to do. All this and many other things can only be explained with the help of the law of octaves, together with an understanding of the role and significance of intervals which cause the line of the development of force constantly to change, to go in a broken line, to turn round, to become its own opposite, and so on. Such a course of things, that is, a change of direction, we can observe in everything. After a certain period of energetic activity or strong emotion, or a right understanding, a reaction comes, work becomes tedious and tiring, moments of fatigue and indifference enter into feeling. Instead of right thinking, a search for compromises begins, suppression, evasion of difficult problems, but the line continues to develop, though now not in the same direction as at the beginning. Work becomes mechanical. Feeling becomes weaker and weaker, and descends to the level of the common events of the day. Thought becomes dogmatic, literal. Everything proceeds in this way for a certain time. Then again there is reaction, again a stop, again a deviation. The development of the force may continue, but the work which was begun with great zeal and enthusiasm has become an obligatory and useless formality. A number of entirely foreign elements have entered into feeling, considering, 
vexation, irritation, hostility. Thought goes round in a circle, repeating what was known before, and the way out which had been found becomes more and more lost. The same thing happens in all spheres of human activity. In literature, science, art, philosophy, religion, in individual and above all in social and political life, we can observe how the line of the development of forces deviates from its original direction and goes, after a certain time, in a diametrically opposite direction, still preserving its former name. A study of history from this point of view shows the most astonishing facts which mechanical humanity is far from desiring to notice. Perhaps the most interesting examples of such a change of direction in the line of the development of forces can be found in the history of religion, particularly in the history of Christianity, if it is studied dispassionately. Think how many turns the line of development of forces must have taken to come from the gospel preaching of love to the Inquisition, or to go from the ascetics of the early centuries studying esoteric Christianity to the scholastics who calculated how many angels could be placed on the point of a needle. The law of octaves explains many phenomena in our lives which are incomprehensible. First is the principle of the deviation of forces. Second is the fact that nothing in the world stays in the same place or remains what it was. Everything moves. Everything is going somewhere is changing and inevitably either develops or goes down, weakens or degenerates. That is to say, it moves along either an ascending or a descending line of octaves. And third, that in the actual development itself of both ascending and descending octaves, fluctuations, rises and falls are constantly taking place. We have spoken so far chiefly about the discontinuity of vibrations and about the deviation of forces. We must now clearly grasp two other principles, the inevitability of either ascent or descent in every line of development of forces, and the periodic fluctuations, the rises and falls in every line, whether ascending or descending, Nothing can develop by staying on one level. Ascent or descent is the inevitable cosmic condition of any action. We neither understand nor see what is going on around and within us, either because we do not allow for the inevitability of descent when there is no ascent, or because we take descent to be ascent these are two of the fundamental causes of our self-deception. We do not see the first one because we continually think that things can remain for a long time at the same level. And we do not see the second because ascents, where we see them, are in fact impossible, as impossible as it is to increase consciousness by mechanical means. Having learned to distinguish ascending and descending octaves in life, we must learn to distinguish ascent and descent within the octaves themselves. Whatever sphere our life we take, we can see that nothing can ever remain level and constant. Everywhere and in everything proceeds the swinging of the pendulum. Everywhere and in everything the waves rise and fall. Our energy in one or another direction which suddenly increases and afterwards just as suddenly weakens. Our moods which become better or become worse without any visible reason. Our feelings, our desires, our intentions, our decisions, all from time to time pass through periods of ascent or descent, become stronger or weaker. And there are perhaps a hundred pendulums moving here and there in man. These ascents and descents, these wave-like fluctuations of moods, thoughts, feelings, energy, determination, 
are periods of the development of forces between intervals in the octave as well as the intervals themselves. Upon the law of octaves and its three principal manifestations depend many phenomena both of a psychic nature as well as those immediately connected with our life. Upon the law of octaves depends the imperfection and the incompleteness of our knowledge in all spheres without exception, chiefly because we always begin in one direction and afterward, without noticing it, proceed in another. As has been said already, the law of octaves in all its manifestations was known to ancient knowledge. Even our division of time, that is, the days of the week into work days and Sundays, is connected with the same properties and inner conditions of our activity which depend upon the general law. The biblical myth of the creation of the world in six days and of the seventh day in which God rested from his labors is also an expression of the law of octaves or an indication of it, though an incomplete one. Why is contemporary science unable to see and understand the fundamental law of three and the fundamental law of seven or octaves? It is based on a misunderstanding of scientific method of denying that which cannot yet be measured by mechanical instruments. A fully developed man, quote, a man in the full sense of the word, unquote, should possess four states of consciousness. An ordinary man, that is, man number one, number two, and number three, lives in two states of consciousness only, first state and second state. To see and understand these fundamental laws in a practical way takes the third and fourth state of consciousness. Knowledge, however, the real objective knowledge, toward which man, as he asserts, is struggling, is possible only in the fourth state of consciousness. That is, it is conditional upon the full possession of the fourth state of consciousness. Knowledge which is acquired in the ordinary state of consciousness, second state, is intermixed with dreams. In this system, we use words to rise above words, Words are connected with concepts, three-dimensional man. The language of third state is analogies. Words are too slow. Four-dimensional man, intuition. The language of fourth state is symbols. Analogies are too slow. Now, back to using words to give a technical explanation to the law of octaves the first step to eventual understanding. Observations based on an understanding of the law of octaves show that vibrations may develop in different ways. In interrupted octaves they merely begin and fall, are drowned or swallowed up by other stronger vibrations which intersect them or which go in an opposite direction. In octaves which deviate from the original direction, the vibrations change their nature and give results opposite to those which might have been expected at the beginning. And it is only in octaves of a cosmic order, both descending and ascending, that vibrations develop in a consecutive and orderly way, following the same direction in which they started. Further observations show that a right and consistent development of octaves, although rare, can be observed in all the occasions of life and in the activity of nature and even in human activity. The right development of these octaves is based on what looks like an accident. It sometimes happens that octaves going parallel to the given octave, intersecting or meeting it, in some way or another fill up its intervals and make it possible for the vibrations of the given octave to develop in freedom and without checks. Observation of such rightly developing octaves establishes the fact 
that if at the necessary moment, that is, at the moment when the given octave passes through an interval, there enters into it an additional shock which corresponds in force and character, it will develop further without hindrance along the original direction, neither losing anything nor changing its nature. In such cases there is an essential difference between ascending and descending octaves. In an ascending octave the first interval comes between me and fa. If corresponding additional energy enters at this point, the octave will develop without hindrance to C, but between C and Do it needs a much stronger additional shock for its right development, because the vibrations of the octave at this point are of a considerably higher pitch, and to overcome a check in the development of the octave a greater intensity is needed. In a descending octave, on the other hand, the greatest interval occurs at the very beginning of the octave, immediately after the first do, and the material for filling it is very often found either in do itself or in the lateral vibrations evoked by do. For this reason, a descending octave develops much more easily than an ascending octave, and in passing beyond C, it reaches Fa without hindrance. Here, an additional shock is necessary, though considerably less strong than the first shock between Do and C. In the big cosmic octave, which reaches us in the form of the ray of creation, we can see the first complete example of the law of octaves. The ray of creation begins with the absolute. The absolute is the all. The all, possessing full unity, full will, and full consciousness, creates worlds within itself, in this way beginning the descending world octave. The absolute is the Do of this octave. The worlds which the absolute creates in itself are C. The interval between Do and C in this case is filled by the will of the absolute. The process of creation is developed further by the force of the original impulse and an additional shock. C passes into La, which for us is our star world, the Milky Way. La passes into Sol, our sun, the solar system. Sol passes into Fa, the planetary world, and here between the planetary world as a whole and our Earth occurs an interval. This means that the planetary radiations carrying various influences to the Earth are not able to reach it, or to speak more correctly, they are not received, the Earth reflects them. In order to fill the interval at this point of the ray of creation, a special apparatus is created for receiving and transmitting the influences coming from the planets. This apparatus is organic life on Earth. Organic life transmits to the Earth all the influences intended for it and makes possible the further development and growth of the Earth, me of the cosmic octave, and then of the moon or ray, after which follows another do nothing. Between all and nothing passes the ray of creation. You know the prayer, Holy God, Holy the Firm, Holy the Immortal? This prayer comes from ancient knowledge. Holy God means the Absolute or All. Holy the Firm also means the Absolute or Nothing. Holy the Immortal signifies that which is between them that is, the six notes of the ray of creation, with organic life. All three taken together make one. This is the coexistent and indivisible trinity. We must now dwell on the idea of the additional shocks which make it possible for the lines of forces to reach a projected aim. As was said before, shocks may occur accidentally. Accident is, of course, a very uncertain thing those lines of development of forces 
which are straightened out by accident, and which man can sometimes see, or suppose, or expect, create in him more than anything else the illusion of straight lines. That is to say, he thinks that straight lines are the rule, and broken and interrupted lines the exception. This in its turn creates in him the illusion that it is possible to do, possible to attain a projected aim. In reality a man can do nothing. If by accident his activity gives a result, even though it resembles only in appearance or in name the original aim, a man assures himself and others that he has attained the aim which he set before himself, and that anyone else would also be able to attain his aim, and others believe him. In reality this is illusion. A man can win at roulette, but this would be accident, attaining an aim which one has set before oneself in life, or in any particular sphere of human activity is just the same kind of accident. The only difference is that in regard to roulette, a man at least knows for certain whether he has lost or won on each separate occasion, that is, on each separate stake. But in the activities of his life, particularly with activities of the kind that many people are concerned with, and when years pass between the beginning of something and its result, a man can very easily deceive himself and take the result obtained as the result desired, that is, believe that he has won when on the whole he has lost. The greatest insult for a man-machine is to tell him that he can do nothing, can attain nothing, that he can never move toward any aim, whatever, and that in striving toward one he will inevitably create another. Actually, of course, it cannot be otherwise. The man-machine is in the power of accident. His activities may fall by accident into some sort of channel which has been created by cosmic or mechanical forces, and they may by accident move along this channel for a certain time, giving the illusion that aims of some kind are being attained. Such accidental correspondence of results with the aims we have set before us or the attainment of aims in small things, which can have no consequences, creates in mechanical man the conviction that he is able to attain any aim, is able to conquer nature, as it is called, is able to arrange the whole of his life, and so on. As a matter of fact, he is, of course, unable to do anything of the kind, because not only has he no control over things outside himself, but he has no control even over things within himself. This last situation must be very clearly understood and assimilated. At the same time it must be understood that control over things begins with control over things in ourselves. With control over ourselves. A man who cannot control himself, or the course of things within himself, can control nothing. In what way can control be attained? The technical part of this is explained by the law of octaves. Octaves can develop consecutively and continuously in the desired direction if additional shocks enter them at the moments necessary, that is, at the moments when vibrations slow down. If additional shocks do not enter at the necessary moments, octaves change their direction. To entertain hopes of accidental shocks, coming from somewhere by themselves at the moments necessary is, of course, out of the question. There remains for a man the choice either of finding a direction for his activities, which corresponds to the mechanical line of events of a given moment, in other words of going where the wind blows, or swimming with the stream, even if this contradicts his inner inclinations convictions and sympathies, or of reconciling himself to the failure of everything he starts out to do. Or he can learn to recognize the moments of the intervals in all lines of his activity and learn to create the additional shocks, in other words, learn to apply to his own activities the method which cosmic forces make use of in creating additional shocks 
at the moments necessary. The possibility of artificial, that is, specially created, additional shocks gives a practical meaning to the study of the law of octaves and makes this study obligatory and necessary if a man desires to step out of his role of passive spectator of that which is happening to him and around him. A man needs to understand the necessary shocks in psychological ascending octaves, in particular his own personal octave to awakening and escape. In natural octaves the requisite shocks are provided automatically but shocks in psychological ascending octaves are not. They have to be supplied by conscious efforts. This is not easily understood partly because we're not accustomed to thinking in terms of octaves and even more because few of the events in which we are concerned are of an ascending character. For the most part our activities are descending octaves arising from the exercise of our own wills and desires. The essential requirement of an ascending octave is acknowledgement of a higher level. Real art, music, and literature are of this quality being an attempt to express unmanifest ideas in forms recognizable by the senses. We have referred to the use of the senses as transformers of meaning. We know how a diagram can convey more meaning than pages of words and certain kinds of diagram or artistic presentation can convey ideas which cannot be expressed in words at all. The synthesis of forms and materials can constitute an ascending octave provided that the artist continues to subordinate himself to the higher level he is striving to reach. Yet there will be places where the progress will falter and his inspiration may fail. This is the place of shock, which has to be surmounted by conscious effort. Again, the most important effort we can make is to endeavor to begin the octave of a man's true evolution, not in the sense of the slow development of the physical body, but the evolution in the vertical scale, the synthesis of the latent materials within us into a conscious being, conscious regeneration, this is an entirely internal process which cannot even commence by any exercise of the sense-based mind. The man-machine can do nothing. To him and around him everything happens. In order to do, it is necessary to know the law of octaves, to know the moments of the intervals and be able to create necessary additional shocks. It is only possible to learn this in a school, that is to say, a rightly organized school which follows all esoteric traditions. Without the help of a school, a man by himself can never understand the law of octaves, the points of the intervals, and the order of creating shocks. He cannot understand because certain conditions are necessary for this purpose, and these conditions can only be created in a school which is itself created upon these principles. How a school is created on the principles of the law of octaves will be explained in due course, and this in its turn will explain to you one aspect of the union of the law of seven with the law of three. In the meantime, it can only be said that in school teaching, a man is given examples of both descending, creative, and ascending, or evolutionary, cosmic octaves. Western thought, knowing neither about octaves nor about the law of three, confuses the ascending and the descending lines and does not understand that the line of evolution is opposed to the line of creation. That is to say, it goes against it as though against the stream. In the study of the law of octaves it must be remembered that octaves in their relation to each other are divided into fundamental and subordinate. The fundamental octave can be likened to the trunk of a tree giving off branches of lateral octaves. The seven fundamental notes of the octave and the two intervals, the bearers of new directions, give altogether nine links of a chain 
three groups of three links each. The fundamental octaves are connected with the secondary or subordinate octaves in a certain definite way. Out of the subordinate octaves of the first order come the subordinate octaves of the second order, and so on. The construction of octaves can be compared with the construction of a tree. From the straight basic trunk there come out boughs on all sides which divide in their turn and pass into branches, becoming smaller and smaller, and finally are covered with leaves. The same process goes on in construction of the leaves, in the formation of the veins, the serrations, and so on. Like everything in nature, the human body which represents a certain whole bears both within and without the same correlations. According to the number of notes of the octave and its intervals, the human body has nine basic measurements expressed by the numbers of a definite measure. In individuals, these numbers, of course, differ widely, but within certain definite limits. These nine basic measurements, giving a full octave of the first order, and by combining in a certain definite way, pass into measurements of subordinate octaves which give rise in their turn to other subordinate octaves, and so on. In this way it is possible to obtain the measurements of any member or any part of the human body, since they are all in a definite relationship to one another. We must understand and feel this law in ourselves, and only then will we see it outside ourselves. Gradually you will be able to think of everything from the point of view of this idea. Everything anomalous unexpected and accidental disappears and an immense and strictly thought-out plan of the universe makes its appearance.